Welcome to the uh, Berkeley Center and this discussion of ending wars well, order, justice, and conciliation. Well, our topic is ending wars well. We want to start our meeting well, uh, not uh, too much later. Um, it's a little awkward to start our meeting without one of our speakers, but we've just heard he is on his way and will be here uh, momentarily. I'm Timothy Shaw. I'm Associate Director of the Religious Freedom Project here at the Berkeley Center. Uh, it is a great honor to be hosting this conversation. Uh, many of you know that this Sunday is Veterans Day, uh, and uh, it occurred to me that there is no better way to honor the men and women who risk their lives, uh, who have risked their lives uh, fighting uh, wars uh, for this country, uh, than to have a discussion about making sure the wars that they fight, the wars in which they fight and die, are worth fighting. And the only way, perhaps the best way, uh, to talk about ensuring uh, that these wars are worth fighting is to ensure that they end well, that they end in a way that secures order, that secures justice, uh, and that secures some modicum of lasting peace. And that a very difficult challenge is precisely the one that Eric Patterson tackles in a brilliant way in his new book, uh, Ending Wars Well, Order, Justice, and Conciliation in Contemporary Post-Conflict with Yale University Press, which has uh, just come out. We're uh, in many, many ways uh, honored to have Eric Patterson. Eric Patterson has been a friend uh, to us uh, here at the Berkeley Center, has been associate director uh, of the Berkeley Center, uh, has been a close friend of many of us, uh, so we're honored and thrilled uh, that uh, he is back now uh, here to talk about uh, his book. It's an honor also because Eric Patterson is a veteran himself, uh, has uh, served our country uh, in uh, various uh, ways in the military. He's also served in the State Department. Uh, he really has an extraordinary record of service to this country, uh, as well as to the Academy uh, in issues of uh, war, peace, uh, uh, justice, uh, and so on. The format today is very simple. Uh, we'll have Eric uh, say uh, a few words about his book, uh, give the gist of the argument, uh, which is a very important and powerful one that transcends and, and crosses numerous disciplines. It, uh, uh, tries to bring together the wor worlds of uh, scholarship and policy. It tries to bridge uh, the worlds of political science and philosophical ethics. Um, it uh, tries to bridge uh, just war uh, theory and just war thinking with thinking about peace building. Uh, he, in other words, tries to bridge academic uh, worlds uh, and worlds of discourse that are often not, not bridged at all. Uh, so. Uh, that's just one of the many uh, accomplishments of Eric Patterson in uh, this book. So we'll first hear uh, from Eric Patterson, then we'll hear from John uh, Gallagher, who uh, we just heard from on the phone, who uh, it will be here uh, momentarily. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Eric Patterson again. <clears throat> it's an extraordinary honor to have Eric here to present uh, this extraordinary book. Eric is uh, still, uh, we're glad to say, a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center uh, for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, he also uh, recently uh, has uh, left the Berkeley Center, uh, left the full-time position he had with us uh, to join the uh, School of Government at Regent University in Virginia Beach, where he is the dean of the School of Government. His research and teaching focuses on religion and politics, ethics, and international affairs, and Just War Theory in the Context of Contemporary Conflict. He has written and edited nine books, uh, including most recently a slew of outstanding books that have uh, appeared in just the last couple of years, uh, Ending War as Well, which I've just talk talked about, we'll talk more about, of course, during this meeting, Ethics Beyond, War Ethics Beyond War's End with Georgetown University Press 2012, and Politics in a Religious world, uh, other books as well. Um, uh, his uh, bio is on the website, so you can look uh, further to learn more about Eric's extraordinary uh, career. Uh, I should say just two other things that uh, leading to 
uh, Eric's interest in the current topic, ending war as well, uh, has been uh, first um, uh, his uh, military service, which I mentioned a moment ago. Eric has uh, served in the Air National Guard for 16 years, uh, including deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, furthermore, he's also uh, spent three years serving in the State Department, working on addressing the, the scourge of landmines and other explosive remnants of war uh, throughout the world. Uh, so it, we're deeply honored uh, and grateful to have Eric Patterson here with us. Eric. Thank you. Tim, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, my thanks to so many familiar faces here in the room. and. Uh, particularly my friends from the State Department who are laughing about landmines. It's an inside joke, but if you heard them chortle there a moment ago. But uh, Tim, thanks for mentioning Veterans Day. Uh, this book was actually the dedication in the book says for those who serve our nation. And my hope has always been that there would be a parsimonious framework that diplomats and aid experts and soldiers could use to think about late and post-conflict. And the book's simple framework is order, justice, conciliation. Uh, a parsimonious framework like the just war tradition. So let me say a word uh, first about the genesis of the book and with two short anecdotes. The first one is this, that uh, in 2003 the U.S. Naval Academy hosted a conference funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities that had 30 academics. I was about the youngest one in the room. They were mostly senior scholars who'd been talking about justice and war for a long time. And so I asked one of the philosophers there, I, I was new to this, I said to him, you've talked a lot about the ethics of deciding to go to war, just war people call it us ad bellum. And you've talked about the morality of how war is fought, which is us in bello. This is the historic just war tradition that goes back 2,000 years. But what about what happens next? Isn't there a part, uh, am I not on? I mean, in this room, you can hear me. Let's see here. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm going up. Oh, that's oh, the video oh, mic. Sorry. I'm supposed to stand. I'll stand over here. Okay. No, I won't. Give me that thing. <laughs> so uh, what about, and I didn't even know what to call it, some sort of post-bellum thing. And this famous philosopher looked at me and he said, there is no such thing. No one's ever asked me that question in 35 years of my career. That stunned me as someone new to this narrow discipline about the just war tradition. The second thing that happened was 18 months later, I was fortunate enough to go as a foster fellow for two years to the U.S. State Department. And the office that I worked in, and I have some colleagues here today, uh, led in U.S. policy to help poor countries in particular to get rid of their excess or their legacy, small arms, light weapons, landmines, their shoulder-launched missiles. If you've seen these movies like Machine Gun Preacher or Nicolas Cage's movie Lord of War or The Blood Di I mean, those types of movies show all of this weaponry in that part of the world that are legacy Cold War stocks. Well, if you've been there, you know it's true. It's not exaggerated in the least. It's amazing how much detritus of war is there, and that's just a small thing. When you think about the psychological aspects of post-conflict and things, hey John, welcome. It's, the question is, I mean, how do you stop wars from continuing the cycle? How, how do you stop that? And what I'd heard a lot of was, well, you know, if you can just get people to give up their guns and sing Kumbaya and you get some peacemaking religious folks in there, it'll all turn out okay. And, and we study this here at the Berkeley Center. I mean, we care deeply about this. But I, I just never found that it, when I thought about it as a father, and I asked myself the question, if I live in South Sudan, what would induce me to give up my gun? If I lived in Afghanistan, what would induce me to give up my gun as a citizen? And my honest answer was, until I stopped carrying bullets at night and I knew that my family was safe, I was not going to turn in my only means of personal protection in a chaotic environment. And so it was really those two things that led me to uh, really where the frontier is of the just war tradition, which is this notion of use post bellum. So what I'd like to do is talk to you for about 10 minutes about the model and the story that's in the book and give you three examples and then turn it over to my colleague who I'm so glad to join us today. So the book's model is, is rooted in the just war tradition and it has these three principles about order and then justice and then conciliation. And the way I'd like for you to think about it is as a pyramid. 
There's one graphic in the entire book. And since we're all close, I'll just show you. It's a pyramid. And if you think about the bottom third of the pyramid, the foundation as being order, and the middle part being justice, and the top little part, you know where the eyeball goes on the US dollar bill? As conciliation. That's the model. What I'm trying to represent graphically is this. Every single conflict, for it to have a stable ending, you have to get to some sort of enduring order. And then sometimes, and honestly, I think it's probably 10, 20, 30% of the time, you can move on to justice. And then in rare cases, you actually get conciliation, but they're probably only 10% of the time. And you'll notice I'm using the word conciliation rather than reconciliation. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, order. The, the foundation of this idea is a war doesn't end well. It really doesn't end unless you have a secure, stable, post-conflict environment. Let me ask you, 1993 in Rwanda, was that post-conflict or pre-conflict? Both. And many wars in the developing world over the past 50 years have been a cycle. They're not linear, beginning and end. Rwanda had their Arusha Accords in 92, and then the genocide broke out 18 months later. And many wars, Sudan, Afghanistan, other places, they're cyclic in nature. And so the question is not, can we get to war termination, but how do we increase security so that most of the parties are willing to buy in into the political order? Now, for those of us who study just war, and we should at Georgetown being a Catholic institution, we know that Augustine and Ambrose and Aquinas and other church fathers, the argument they were making was that political order is a moral good. We sometimes forget that in the modern society because we have it so good in the United States. But having basic levels of security, it's not just a pragmatic good, it's a moral good. It's the society within which citizens can live the good life, that notion that we take all the way back to Aristotle. And so the book argues that the, for a war to end well, you don't start with reconciliation, you don't start with justice, you start with trying to put uh, establish security on the ground, security on the borders, and some basic government institutions, the law and order institutions. Now, I, I gotta tell you that many of my friends at USAID and USIP say, Eric, that's not enough. And my answer to, this, to them is, I would like a lot more, but honestly, in most, most of the third world, if you just got that, they'd be better off. I mean, that was what I saw traveling to Congo, traveling to Angola, traveling to Burundi, traveling to Afghanistan, traveling to Pakistan, is if you could just have a basic level of security, that would be wonderful. Well, the second, and, and let me give you an example of this. Think about the Korean War. It lasted for three years. Each year of that war, a million people died. Did you realize it was that many? I mean, most people don't realize a million people died each of the years of that war. We lost as many troops in 24 months as we lost in Vietnam. It's within 500 to 1,000 the number. It's 54,000 for Korea, it's about 55,000 for Vietnam. We usually don't, we don't realize the gross magnitude of the horror of the Korean War. How did it end? It ended with an armistice, but that armistice has endured, a cold peace has endured on the Korean Peninsula for 60 years now. It's actually a remarkable achievement when you think about it. South Korea has been secure. The neighborhood has remained secure. Now, I wish that there was justice against the people who attacked in the first place. And I wish that there was a, a more rich kind of con conciliation, reconciliation across the DMZ for the Korean people. We're not there yet. But I got to tell you, the track record of 1955, 1956, 1957 with no one dying compared to a million people, mostly civilians, dying in the early 50s, it's much better. So the second principle beyond order is justice. And the just war tradition goes back to this principle that you know, there really is morality, there really is right and wrong in international life. Augustine said, well, the just reasons to fight are to prevent a wrong, to punish wrongdoers, or to right a past wrong. And that's really the notion of justice. And in this book, I define justice very narrowly in a very old fashioned way. Justice is incurring what one deserves. 
It's not grandiose restorative forms of justice. It begins with a, a very narrow punition or punishment type of justice. By the way, in the just war tradition, that should give us a little bit of modesty because its roots in the Judeo-Christian tradition say, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we ought to have some modesty in pointing the finger at others. We ought to know what's wrong. We ought to limit it. We ought to prevent it. We ought to punish it. We ought to do it with some restraint and modesty. And the book gives a couple of cases of this. Let me just mention one. Consider the difference between Iraq 91 and Iraq 2003. In both cases, the Iraqi leadership was aggressive. Iraq, as you know, attacked three of its neighbors in its history, Iran, Israel, and then it gobbled up Kuwait. The U.S. led a coalition in 91. And then after the war, how did we punish them? With draconian sanctions, where the leadership responsible continued to build palaces and live a good life. And where the common person was smashed. How did we punish, how, how was the elite punished in 2003? It was a jur juridical process, trials for Saddam and the other elites. It was Iraqis who led those trials. It was in accord with Iraqi law and some elements of international law. And Saddam was hung by his own people. That's a much more targeted approach in the aftermath of war than the kind of war crimes uh, that are war guilt like we had at the end of World War I or in, two, in 1991. So the last, conciliation. You know, the book uh, doesn't argue that you have to get all of these right in order in every single case, although you have to have that security element. These things are reinforcing. You know, arrows might go up and down that pyramid as you deepen justice in theory. In some cases, it should help the order. Again, I think it's only in some cases. What is conciliation? Conciliation is being able to take your antagonist from the past and imagine a shared future with them. They don't become your brother, necessarily. It's not kumbaya. I don't sacrifice all of my claims that my family or country have against an aggressor. But it's a willingness to move forward rather than be stuck as a victim in the past. It's usually rooted in a situation where there's a really pragmatic calculus about interests and security. That's why I don't think that the Afghan Taliban is ever going to cut a deal through one of these reconciliation processes. It hasn't been in their interests to go for security in that way because they haven't felt like they needed to. And they don't have some sort of brotherly love for the coalition or apostate Afghans as they see them. Let me give you a different example. Think about, and this is a very narrow conciliation in international affairs. So often our examples are domestic, but how about in international life? Think back to the 1970s with Israel and Egypt. They fought a war in 48, or there was a war in 48, 56, 67, 73. Sadat is on the stage, and all the way up through the spring of 1978, he was a vociferous critic of Israel. That fall, though, he goes on national TV and says, I will go to the ends of the earth for peace. No more young men should die on either side of the border. That year, Menachem Begin, a real hawk for those of us who remember, I mean, a real hawk, was elected. And Begin took the olive branch invited him to Israel, where, he, where Sadat made a, a, a speech before the Knesset that said, we have a lot of grievances against you, and I'm not giving them up. If you read the speech, it's actually a pretty tough speech. However, I don't think any more mothers should lose their sons. I don't think any more fathers should lose their sons. And so I am willing to have a conversation about peace. That was November of 78, and then they meet in Camp David, in January and February of 79, and you know the story from there. Now, is there a lot of love between those two countries? No. But was there a pretty raw, cold peace that developed a, and really a conciliatory approach based in part on 
mutual security interests, based in part on the pragmatism of the support of the United States financially through all that. But it took a leader making that kind of public statement. Both, of, both Sadat and Begin had a lot to lose. You know, Sadat was assassinated two, years, two and a half years later. There was a lot that could have been lost in that situation. The book gives another reconciliation case from a, from a, a, a situation of the crimes against humanity in East Timor, in which cultural mechanisms were used for people not after order was imposed by the UN for there to be reconciliation. That was culturally relevant. Uh, but, but when you think about international life, real conciliation is difficult. Well, in closing, that's the argument. And what I would love is for this book that's dedicated to those who serve our nation to, for so many in government service, to have a framework, a simple framework, not a 57-page document, but a simple framework. Okay, how do we get, how do we establish order? Is there an opportunity for justice? How do we limit that? How do we restrain it? How do we build mechanisms for conciliation or reconciliation? Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. Appropriately enough, to respond to Eric Patterson, we are honored to have with us another extraordinary public servant and another uh, public servant who has also served America in the military uh, and really someone who has an extraordinary uh, variety of experiences uh, dealing with the kinds of issues we'll be talking about today. Uh, John Gallagher is a U.S. Army officer currently serving as a special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He previously served as a special assistant to the commander of U.S. Central Command in Tampa, Florida, and the Commander International Security and Assistance Force in Kabul, Afghanistan from 2010 to 2012. Prior to his deployment, uh, he was a director in the Office of Iraq and Afghanistan Affairs at the National Security Council from 2007 to 2009 where he also served as a White House Fellow. From 2004 to 2007, John Gallagher was an assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences at West Point, where he taught courses in American politics, political philosophy, and counterterrorism. He is a recipient of the William F. Murdy Award for Teaching Excellence uh, at West Point. He was also the director of West Point's National Merit Scholarship Program, and he was president of the West Point Honor Society of Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, again, he's an Army officer. Uh, he served with the 82nd Airborne Division and the 1st Armored Division. Uh, he graduated from West Point in 1994. He holds two master's degrees with distinction from the University of Chicago, one in public policy and one in political theory. He is a former member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was named a young leader by the American, Swiss, and French American Foundations and is the co-editor of Debating the War of Ideas. Uh, with Eric Patterson, as a matter of fact. So we're delighted to have you, John Gallagher. Thanks. Also, um, blood type A negative, just to clarify. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for, th for the detailed uh, introduction and your kind words. Um, let me just start out by saying I've really had the pleasure uh, over the years of working closely with Eric uh, and on occasion closely with the Berkeley Center um, whether attending events, reading their products, or just discussing issues uh, of great importance with the leadership here. Um, it's an important topic, and uh, what the Berkeley Center does and stands for is absolutely crucial, uh, and I would actually like to see a whole host of institutions throughout our great universities uh, do what the Berkeley Center is doing. Um, there's some of it, not enough, and so I'm really, really honored to be here again. Um, that said, uh, let me just say um, quickly something about Eric, uh, and I'll relate it to um, my three daughters who like to watch um, uh, Pixar movies over and over again. Um, and that is, <clears throat> as I queued up a, a recent movie for my five-year-old, um, she required that I sit through the previews. I couldn't just fast forward to the movie itself. And I saw an interview with one of the founders of Pixar. People are familiar with Toy Story and some of these other movies. And he was discussing uh, how at the end of editing for Toy Story 1, they realized if this venture is going to be what we think it is, then we already need to be thinking about what we're going to do next. We can't suffice to sort of bask in the successes of the phase that we're in. 
we need to look beyond it and have what maybe Kaplan would describe as a bit of anxious foresight, action that needs to be taken now to be in a place where you need uh, to be later. And he described right here at this Italian restaurant how the idea for Wally -E and Up and Toy Story 2 and Ants or A Bug's Life or whatever the movies were, Monsters, Inc., uh, those concepts were born right there at the table. The reason I was so impressed with that miniature interview is because I had already seen those other movies. So I knew that that individual got off the table and actually put those things out there to get to, to basically implement the ideas that were born. Eric Patterson is exactly that type of scholar. And if you read the intro to his book, you'll see that the manuscript was all but completed in 2010. Things take a while to actually go through the publishing process. But how lucky are we that Eric has this anxious foresight that something needs to be done now so that when we are where we are on a place like Afghanistan, we now have a framework or a lens that we can use to guide us as we make very difficult, minute decisions. And we're making them even now as I work for the chairman. And again, having come out of Petraeus' staff and the NSS before that. Um, so it's a credit to Eric uh, um, that he's able to not only think about these issues in this way, but then produce a framework that helps us think about them as well and join him. Um, I will say that when I was in grad school at the University of Chicago, there was a group called Wage Peace, a very well-intentioned organization that wants less violence in the world and greater protection for individuals. And two of their sort of core tenets, uh, uh, we believe, and this is just paraphrasing uh, with apologies to, to this group, um, we believe that people have the right to live their lives without being exposed to violence and fearing, uh, fearing death uh, or injury. And we also do not believe in the um, use of military force. It's not necessary. And I said, well, I'm just coming back from Kosovo where Albanian civilians are being mowed down and buried in mass graves by the Serb VJ army. And we introduced some force that stopped that. So which side are you on? Are you supporting our use of military force in Kosovo to prevent this? Or are you concerned that we introduced military force, though we did it to prevent the slaughter of innocents? And the answer was, um, well, I don't, think it, I don't think it's unrealistic to imagine a world where this type of violence and force is necessary. Fine. In the meantime, we have Eric Patterson. And in the meantime, we have a lot of great people who want to span this space between the moral and the pragmatic, or the ideal and the real. And indeed, it is the theme that comes out of the book for me. Just War Theory helps us use force wisely and in a restrained way. It doesn't advocate that we not use it, but it also recognizes that there's a human tendency to tend toward the extreme when force is used. Um, Eric cites legitimate authority, right intent, just cause, discrimination, proportionality. They all help us engage in this regrettable duty that is war making. But they also help us in a post-conflict environment. But a framework is needed. Everybody here has probably uh, read Kenneth Waltz, The Man, The State, and War. Whatever it is, it's something that helps us think about war. Is it being driven by a bellicose nature in the individual leader of a country? Is it driven by the nature of that country's institutions or its history? Or is war dream being driven by anarchy in the international system? Or some combination of those three things? Thank you to Dr. Waltz for giving us that. And then we can all begin the debate on what applies and what doesn't. And Eric is doing the same thing right now. Uh, and it's extremely helpful. In war, just war theory is applied, but it's, it, it's applied with many frameworks principles of war, different phases, the synchronizing of battlefield effects. In the same way for post-conflict environments, Patterson gives us order, justice, and conciliation. And he says, oh, by the way, don't forget to take into account the likelihood of success, lest your attempts at justice tend towards uh, being too vindictive and create fresh injustices, or um, uh, lest your attempts um, at conciliation be utopian in nature and too high-minded and they never get anywhere. So again, the pragmatic um, and the moral uh, combined in Eric's thinking. I'm concerned a little bit in that when Eric breaks out these, I, the idea of order, um, which has the cessation of killing as a component, um, sovereignty from a single authority, sort of a monopoly on the, uh, the use of force, and a maturation of government capacity. And it also includes this idea of no spoilers, right? No armed spoilers, belligerents up in the hillside waiting to come ruin it all. Um, that's a tall order, right? And something like that might be possible in a type of warfare. 
something that Eric refers to as classic war. Um, maybe you might think of the movie <coughs> I, Robot, right? Where the robots are fight. Uh, this is a Will Smith movie, forgive me for all the popular culture. But these, these, these robots continue to fight and continue to fight, and something can happen. The signing of a treaty, at my command, to stop fighting, and they'll stop. This is different than warfare that is born out of a narrative, right? Or a story of injustice, philosophical rage, right? Uh, um, warfare that is born in this way, it gets a new steward every time a leader is killed. And the ability to shut off that fighting force requires a new narrative. Or it requires a degree of sort of adjudication on the story that got them fighting in the first place. So to ask order to be sort of a baseline condition before you can move on to justice or conciliation, it may not apply as well into sort of what I, you, one might call these philosophical warriors that I think are even more common today than the force on force type of war. He talks about justice, which has the components of punishment and restitution. Uh, again, a, as Eric identifies, this has to be done in an extremely careful ways, lest it produce new injustices, extremely difficult to do, and then conciliation, as I've already said, civil war, classic war. Um, Eric, I think you pointed out that that a serious attempts at conciliation were only tried in some 12 out of 100 conflicts that you studied, and uh, four of those failed. So we've got an 8% success rate. Again, extremely difficult, as you know. Um, but to say that this type of order comes from victory and the hard work that goes into achieving this victory, I think it overlooks um, the nature of conflict and the actors on the ground that actually favor disorder and a degree of rupture and benefit from it. Not because they're better off materially, not because they don't want civic peace someday, but because they're fighting for a greater sense of moral meaning and they'll give up a thicker mattress, they'll give up dental care, paved sidewalks, they'll give up cessation of violence to stay in a place where they are advancing what they believe to be moral meaning worth fighting for and dying for. So getting order when this is the type of fight that you're dealing with is, is uh, going to be difficult to come by, almost impossible. Um, Eric wisely points out that in, in, in many cases in war, especially of a civil nature, the factions remain in vicinity of one another. So it's different if we were to go in, in interstate war, we go somewhere, there's a conflict, we find a way to bring about an equilibrium, we start the process of justice and we leave and there's barely the square root of what we had in the country left over. That's different than a lot of the belligerents being uh, right next to each other. Um, and I think you will always have spoilers who were called off the sidelines to fight using a narrative about what is a just society, what's worth fighting for. And people, and some of the examples you've given it, 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 with Egypt and Israel, people get 20 years down that pipeline and say it's not worth it anymore. No more sons should die. The, the problem is there are fresh people just entering the pipeline who are filled with the philosophy or the story and they don't have 20 years of exhaustion or they're not yet convinced that it's um, a fruitless endeavor and they're not ready. So as we've seen in some of these examples, they're willing to take lethal action to keep the fight going because they're not buying that the time is ready to, for conciliation. Um, so dealing with the spoiler issues is uh, particularly problematic. So a major question for me then um, is how does this framework change and how do we, the United States, change our behavior depending on where are we on this sort of decision tree, right? So is it classic war or civil? And if it's civil, is it sort of crossing over state boundaries and becoming a regional issue? Um, is, it, is it filled with humanitarian crises that require the international community to come in, but it started out as sort of this internal local grievance? And depending on where we are in this sort of model, right, then how does order, justice, and conciliation change? Does the shape of the triangle change? Does order come second after some degree of justice occurs? Um, these are some questions that I would throw out to the floor um, and also to Eric. Um, so let me wrap up by saying, are we, the United States, simply worse off each time we try to wade in? Eric cites, um, Dr. Michael Walzer in saying there's like ethics of exit and paradoxes, right? So here's some choices, things we could do. We could sort of take the China model, which is don't get embroiled in anything. The obligation doesn't fall to us because we don't get involved. Uh, number two, we could try to do post-conflict and do it poorly, excuse me, 
Um, we could do expeditionary things only. Go to Afghanistan, kick over the anthill, tell them very clearly, whatever you rebuild, if it's a threat to us, we'll come back in five years, kick over the anthill again, and maybe we do it. And then five years later, we come back, we're at the 10-year mark, and maybe things are better in Afghanistan than they are now, and we didn't have to spend all that money and blood and treasure over a 10-year period. Maybe that is how we approach it. But I think it's politically unsustainable given who we are as a nation. Three, we try to do post-conflict and we do it poorly, or, or we only do half of it. Or four, we try to do post-conflict and we do it well. And I think after reading the book, we not only have to do number four, we have to engage in post-conflict, but we have to do it well. And it's possible that the flurry of writing and thinking in this area over the last five years is only advocating half of the equation. Maybe it's treating people on the ground like economic man, and it describes things like provision and governance in terms of rebuilding, restructuring, feeding, paving, increasing the time for goods to get to market. That's all important, but it's half the story. It's treating people who are more than economic man like they're this economic species. And I think we're doing this more and more. We're writing about it and we're thinking about it more and more because we know there's a new relationship between sort of the micro actor and how much trouble he can cause. So before it took whole armies crossing borders to represent a significant threat to the United States, now a small number of people can engage in a behavior that constitutes a significant threat. So we have to go down into the micro and engage them in constructive ways to prevent it. I think we're doing it, but a lot of the literature advocates about half of it and doesn't give us a lot of tools how to engage credible and constructive voices on the ground, let's say in Afghanistan, to promote a version of Pashtun Wali or Islam that causes some of these moral meaning fighters to change the way that they engage their own government. It's a hard space for us to wade into, but remember where we're sitting. We're sitting at the Berkeley Center. And the Berkeley Center, to me, is the leading institution among universities in America for getting at that aspect of, of ending wars well. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and be a part of this. Um, I will, I will um, end by saying um, we have no choice to do it well. We have to leverage the ideal and the real. I'm thankful for Eric and his anxious foresight. We might throw out on the table um, another option, which is do nothing and an obligation later to help end the war well. And, and I don't hear anybody talking about that, meaning find a China or an India or a Japan who aren't heavily involved in the front end of something like Afghanistan and say now that we're in the, in the business of transition and we're in a post-2014 environment, here's a chance for you to get serious about your contributions to the end phase of the conflict and really shift the heavy burden onto those who have capacity who maybe were not willing or were not able to play a heavy part in the front end. Um, so with that, I'm sure I went over time. No, Thank no, you for no, allowing no. me to speak on this topic. Thanks very much. Uh, Thank you, John Gallagher, very, very much. Uh, what I'd like to do first, before we uh, hear from you, is I'd like to uh, ask uh, Eric Patterson uh, to respond um, uh, to uh, some of the comments that uh, John Gallagher made as, as briefly or as expansively as you'd like, uh, Eric. And uh, in the meantime, you all can be thinking of your questions and comments. Uh, and uh, so we'll turn to you uh, shortly. But first, uh, Eric. I think that the only thing that I would say is, is that uh, two models for U.S. involvement, one is the way that we ended the U.S. Civil War, and the second one is the way we ended World War II. And one of the things that they both had in common, and they, they largely follow this model, uh, we crushed the other side. And that's a part of these types of discussions that is often left out these days. And the, the question John was asking about fighting a type of fighter that is fighting for a narrative, that is fighting for a set of ideas that's really not necessarily embodied in this world. Uh, I mean, that's one of the questions really is, do you, is the, is the and, and specifically I made the comment earlier in the presentation simply about Afghanistan and how I was very, uh, I didn't have a lot of confidence in the peace jurgas when they started two and a half years ago now after six months of secret talks. I didn't have very much confidence because it wasn't in the interest of the other side to come to the table. They weren't feeling the pressure. And so I simply wonder, uh, and I say this kind of with my head down because it makes me sad to think that, I mean, really to get there, 
You have to crush them. In other words, there's nothing like victory to bring the other side to the table to start a conversation about how you include them in the political order. That's how we ended the U.S. Civil War. That's how we ended World War II. And I'm just talking about kind of the raw pragmatism about how you get to the point where you can do all this other stuff. And I think that type of fighter, that's how you do it. Well, as I was hearing uh, both of these uh, scholars talk about this issue, it occurred to me that it really is extraordinary how much in our political discourse there is an exclusive discussion about ending a number of the wars we've been talking about, virtually no discussion about ending them well. Uh, there is anxious foresight, uh, to use your phrase, uh, um, Mr. Gallagher, about uh, ending these wars uh, whatever way we can, as soon as we can, uh, but interestingly, much less discussion about the issues that uh, fortunately you're enabling us to talk about today. How do we end these conflicts well? So I invite uh, those of you interested uh, to pose a question or uh, raise a comment to, to do so. Uh, I'd ask that you first identify yourself, uh, let us know who you are, and then make your comment and question as, uh, as brief as possible to allow others to participate. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Amjad Chaudhary. I'm from Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and uh, for a long time uh, I, I was also in the army. Uh, I'm a retired army, and I work in NIH. And the thing is, for a long time, the U.S. Uh, thought that uh, if there is a conflict somewhere, they can go there and uh, solve this with war. And for, for uh, not too long time, uh, the U.S. also realized that international freedom of religion is more important than going to war. And th that's why we have uh, wars in uh, Iraq, in Afghanistan, and many, many other countries. And the other thing, the, um, uh, uh, the Eric told us about the morality, and I think the morality come from the God uh, who is watching us, and the second coming of Jesus. Uh, in Amdiya Muslim community, and they say that the second coming of Jesus had happened, and that that's where the he will bring the morality, he will bring the peace, and he will bring the justice. And uh, that model, I think you, everybody can examine that model. And that model is the, uh, for 100 years, we've been working on peace, work, working on the justice. And the last year, uh, not, uh, this year, our international, um, uh, international, uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, 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 leader, he came here, and uh, it's surprisingly, the U.S. Uh, con um, at uh, um, U.S. Congress, he spoke, and there were 23 congressmen, and their departments were hearing them him, about the uh, peace in international peace that could be achieved, and that, that's what I'm saying is that. Uh, uh, instead of like going to war, we can still work on the international uh, religious freedom. Thank you very much. Eric, do you want to make a comment about uh, the relationship between religious freedom and the things that you've written the, about? The, the only thing I'd say is, uh, just as a brief comment, is, is that what you've identified is, is that in post-conflict and late conflict, we need all the organs of the U.S. government working hand in hand. And so, uh, you know, a noteworthy thing from this year is, is that the State Department finally elevated the part of the government that does this in 2012, finally elevated that organ of the government to the status of having a bureau within the State Department from being an ad hoc office, largely populated by, and I have nothing against them, I was one, but by contractors rather than investing the money in full-time equivalent, in other words, full-time State Department diplomatic personnel. So that's a, that's a positive change. We need state 
aid, et cetera, working hand in glove on this. That's all I'd say about it. Hi, um, I'm, my name's Jacqueline. I'm a student at Georgetown for right. the semester. Um, so you guys talked a lot about wars in the past and how um, people put so much thought into why they enter into war and how they conduct the war. Um, but I guess I'm wondering how that might connect to how you would end the war. Um, and going forward, um, I haven't read the book yet, but I plan to soon. Um, um, uh, but so going forward, if there's so much more, um, if people put more ideas into how to end a war well and have a I don't know, concise end where everyone kind of comes together, how do you think that the way that you go about entering into war and conducting war affects that result? Um, and do you think that there might be a change in the future on how people think about um, what causes are just and what um, what reasons for fighting, um, how that would, I don't know, transition well into a peaceful world. Thank you. So um, I think this is it really almost exactly uh, where Eric hopes that this book will go. Um, in some ways, uh, when you introduce a framework like this, and you can find in both the conclusion and other places throughout the book, you know, in some ways Eric is saying, hey everybody, if you're in a classroom at Oxford later on and you can say, you know, order, justice, conciliation, and then the great minds of people who have to do this, practitioners, thinkers, writers, policymakers, can then add nuance to how it actually gets applied to real live, not only cases in the past, but going forward, then I think Eric would argue we're starting to take a comprehensive or holistic look at war and how the end of one touches or possibly causes the beginning of another. And if you don't look that far in, then the calculus you use about waging or even going to war in the first place is an incomplete uh, calculation. So I just want to reinforce the question. I think that's exactly right. And some have said, I think it was Gideon Rose maybe or, or someone in his book on a similar, on a similar topic, um, said if we took a, a sort of a full stock of what it would take in Iraq, the decisions up front may have been um, modified to the extent that we chose a different time or chose a completely different approach. Um, to the conflict. So uh, I'm an advocate uh, of a holistic view, and, and when you start doing that, you just make better choices from a pragmatic resource expenditure side and from an idealistic uh, moral side. It's really the right way to look at it, I think. Hi, my name is Lisa Shirk. Uh, I'm a professor of peacebuilding, and I work at the Alliance for Peacebuilding here in Washington. And I just want to make sure, I, I think it's great as military government, you know, is paying attention to this whole field, but to really recognize that it is a field for 20 to 30 years. Um, so the members of our alliance are Notre Dame, George Mason University, Harvard, Stanford. I mean, major universities have had masters and PhD programs in conflict resolution, war termination for decades. And there's an entire literature basically just on this topic um, and it hasn't really made its way into government or into the military. That's what a couple of us in the room spend our time doing, is trying to bring all of these lessons about how do you bring an end to the war. But I didn't really hear that, that the, the research here had been located within that broader field. So I um, just encourage you <laughs> to make those links with those of us who are, who are trying to do that. I think the most important thing here that we have found is that there are really different types of conflicts, which is something that you mentioned. And sometimes order is uh, really foundational and the core thing. Um, and certainly in Congo and other places, people really long for it. But in other places, like in Egypt, um, people are willing to give up all kinds of order because it's an unjust order. <laughs> and they are willing to put up with lots of chaos and actually enter into civil war chaos because the justice question is so important for them. And I think so, ma so many security sectors around the world 
treat people differently according to their religion, their identity. Yeah. And so therefore, some people have order and other people don't. And so I think in those kinds of situations, the model just needs to be more complex because order, it's, uh, people are willing to give up order to get those other things. Thanks. <coughs> well, uh, I'm not sure if I should start with the good news or th the bad. Or, or, I mean, you've hit something very powerful on the head, and so I'm glad that you addressed it. So there's a chapter in this book that uh, looks at, it tries to evaluate the different, uh, these new sub-disciplines, I'd call them, within the social sciences of conflict resolution theory, uh, international human rights law, uh, transitional justice as distinct from conflict resolution, and to evaluate their presuppositions and then ask a couple questions. The first one being, how do they comport with the just war tradition? You know, the just war tradition is the basis for the laws of armed conflict. It's the basis for Western military doctrine. We get the principle of sovereignty, the foundational principle of international affairs from the just war principle of legitimate authority. So it's the, you know, it's the framework for how we think about the Western tradition. It's, it's just kind of the foundation without us even seeing it any longer. There have been these other contributions that you just mentioned. Now, th there's an entire chapter devoted to this in the book, and it largely argues that some of them, like transitional justice in specific, really are commensurate with the just war tradition. Why? Because there's an emphasis on morality, the justice component, the punishment component, the notion about rehabilitation and things, all fits well within this tradition. And it assumes the rule of law, et cetera. Um, I actually make an argument in the book uh, that some of the elements, though, of the conflict resolution literature really don't match. And I think you've exposed this. I mean, that there are some differences between the two traditions. Uh, let me mention one of those to you, and it's simply, and you know, this principle of order really is one. The book says right from the beginning that I'm going to narrow my, you know, this work to real situations of conflict. And for me, that means war. And social scientists, until very recently, talked about conflict as war, uh, not as sparring, not as, a cup, not as domestic violence or any of these kinds of things. Now, there is a, there's a trend in parts of the academy to say, well, all conflict is conflict. It's all the same thing. As a social scientist, I just really had to narrow it to a certain type of conflict. And so if it's not war, rebellion, guns going off, you know, people shooting each other, et cetera, that's really the scope of the book. It does give some uh, some bona fide, some some credence to strong things in the conflict resolution literature, but it also distinguishes itself from that. And I would say, for instance, in e and by the way, I'm going to stop and let you push back. Um, you know, Egypt and some of these other ones, that's not a war. So much of the conflict resolution literature, I'm going to be provocative if you don't mind, um, is based on one case, 75%, and you can ask two of my research assistants, because I made them look it up, Alan and Elizabeth, 70, uh, who are now professionals out there in the marketplace, 75% of the literature on conflict resolution uses as its case in international life, South Africa. South Africa is a great case, but it was not a war. And so we've done a lot of extrapolating from a case that isn't even a case. It's important, but it was not a war. Now I'm gonna stop and let you push right back because that's why we're here, we're at an academic environment. You can say I'm wrong, it's okay. Okay, I, I, I think if you're looking specifically at war termination, South Africa isn't a war, but certainly not half of the literature of war termination is about South Africa. I mean, the ca the cases, there's hundreds the cases and hundreds literature. of books. There's whole libraries of books on conflict resolution, conflict trans transformation, termination. I mean, this is a really complex field. I can't summarize it all up here. I just, I just point out that we're just touching one little piece of it here, and it's, it's really, there's much more to it than South Africa. I mean, it's, it's Kosovo, it's Liberia, it's Sri Lanka. I've worked in over 25 countries on war termination. And um, so I just, I just want right. to just give a taste of right. everything that's out there. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, my, maybe I said it poorly, the successful case that's referred to in our study, and we, and we ended it in 2010, 75% of the time in the literature, the successful case was South Africa. That's what, that's what we found in a voluminous lit review. 
Thank you, uh, both of you gentlemen, for, for your comments. Uh, Eric, it's great to have you back. Um, in your response to the Colonel, you talked, you, you gave us two examples, uh, Civil War and World War II. Of course, those two examples were basically state-to-state -state relationships. Um, I think that a lot of what the Colonel was referring to had to do with insurgency, uh, counterinsurgency, and those kinds of uh, challenges, the kinds of challenges we're facing in places like Afghanistan today. Um, and I would argue that uh, your comments, therefore, don't necessarily match up with those kind, with resolving or finding conciliation with, with uh, in those situations. Because if you go out and crush the enemy, you rapidly go past the point at which you can, therefore, um, find some sort of conciliation, uh, or you make worse the problem, uh, like the like the colonel said, of uh, that sort of uh, moral. Uh, uh, anger just growing even even further, and many of the the uh, examples that you brought up just now uh, regarding international war and just war theory again have to do with the law of war, the war, the law that nations, that states, governments are supposed to follow. So how do we use this structure in a pragmatic way going forward to address those kinds of uh, insurgency environments? Part of this depends on what the uh, insurgency or the terrorist group is what their articulated aims are. So uh, many of you know David Kilcullen's work, The Accidental Guerrilla, and I think this is an important one. I think this is a contact point where we largely agree, and that is that the argument that David Kilcullen makes is is that there's a, there's a kind of a small intellectual vanguard of violent Islamists, the Salafis, Al-Qaeda types, who have a global vision for transforming the world. But that most guys who join up at the local level in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in southern Thailand, they're not really a part of that. They have local grievances, real grievances, and they're Muslim. And what happens is that someone helps them to understand, you know, the problems you're having locally actually tie to this much bigger narrative that's out there and or average Joe Blow farmer was just minding his own business and really had no stake in the fight until a drone killed his nephew. He didn't want to become a guerrilla. He may have been apolitical. He may have had no idea about all this, and now he's angry. And he decides, I'm going to listen to this, a local narrative or a national narrative. I'm going to get involved. There's really two mechanisms there that kill Cullen kind of elides. That puts one in a very difficult situation about how to make peace in that type of situation. And in Afghanistan, it's very com complicated because we've changed our war aims about every two years. In other words, what started as a fairly limited became a nation building project and it's very difficult to get out of those. So what I would say in response after obscuring the issue is that uh, there's gonna be dedicated groups, brigands, pirates, a certain type of terrorist organization I don't think they're going to come to the table. They're bad actors outside of state, and there, there's going to have to be a vigilant level of fighting against them in a war situation or as law enforcement. However, I think that these other groups, these accidental guerrillas, actually really do want a base level of order and justice. A point that the book makes, I'd simply say, is, is that in 2002, 2003 in Afghanistan, there weren't very many claims for justice against the United States. We've been there for 10 years, and the local Afghan has a lot more claims against the U.S. when you take it from a just war perspective. That's a change that happens when you're involved over a long period of time, and those are things that we have to account for that we didn't have to account for in that first six or eight months. So that, it's, a, it's a partial answer. I'll just put in a quick uh, plug for my friend and colleague Monica Toft, who's written a book called Securing the Peace, in which she interestingly argues, based on a large analysis of, uh, uh, of some 40 or 50 civil wars, I think, in the modern period, that the, the best way to, to achieve a secure end, an enduring end to civil wars, is for one side to defeat the other, uh, for there to be outright uh, victory. Now that doesn't mean decimating the other side necessarily, uh, but outright victory is the, is the surest path to enduring order in a way. 
uh, according to uh, Monica's analysis. Uh, yes, sir, second row. Oh, I'm Chip House from the Alliance for Peace Building as well. And, and I want to push a little bit on the discussion that you and Lisa had because I've heard it before. And it's an interesting one, but I want to push it on a fairly specific issue because you're both right. Um, when I haven't read this book, but you're, uh, the other stuff that you've written that I've read and liked defines terms a little bit differently from, uh, th you define them as I would as a political scientist rather than I would as a conflict resolution guy. Um, and what I, I heard as well is a sense that you're saying that all three of the pieces of your pyramid have to be addressed and I'm also hearing, though you didn't say it here, is that maybe you're also saying that all three have to be worked on more or less together and more or less by the same people. However, when I look at the way I'm trained as a peace builder and John's trained as a colonel, his skill set is more doing your, the bottom of your pyramid. My skill set is more doing the conciliation slash reconciliation. I don't care what you call it stuff how do we enhance the dialogue so that you and Lisa or you and I don't talk past each other and so that things like I you didn't teach in it but the winning the peace course at West Point yeah how uh, how do we make those kinds of enterprises the norm rather than the exception and so the question is how do we get the two of you or the two of us together more Great question. Thank you, sir. Jenny, you want to say something about that? Sure. All right. So, uh, really great question. And as I followed the exchange here, all I was thinking was, you know, I'm very thankful to be spending some time um, in some of these jobs where we're trying to reach back to the very best and apply it. And uh, I thought of John Yoder, if I'm getting the name right. He wrote a book for just war theorists to sort of teach them look, I'm not one of you. I'm a pacifist. I don't know if he's a Notre Dame guy or not. And he said, but if you're going to get serious about being just war theorists, you ought to read this book. Here's how, right? So get your terms straight, get your concepts straight, and then really move forward and bring the full merit of this body of thought to the table. And in a way, he was sort of helping. So to me, it's, it's, it's illustrative of the discussion we're having here. And I want to know more, meaning I want to see the connection happen between you because we need it desperately and don't think sometimes it's a capacity issue on the failure to really get serious about ending wars well to be honest just having seen the the the, the activity in the hallways you have a certain amount of bandwidth a certain amount of spots a certain amount of talent and it's everything you can bring to the fight just to even begin to intercede with the use of military force well so with all these things against us I very much want to see um, this happen let me just give you two quick quotations one um, Carafano at Heritage uh, referring to this topic saying it's a big mistake to think that if leaders are just super smart on the front end of war things will all turn out right on the back end America needs a deeper and richer kit bag of capacities and conceptual tools if it hopes to do better at ending wars and Eric himself says um, referring to the success of this framework being used he says, a new generation of just war scholarship is needed, one that actively engages the hard USAD bellum and USIN bellow cases facing the world, colon, transnational terrorism, piracy, robotics, UAVs and drones, cyber warfare, and weapons of mass effect. So what I'm hearing is, I'm seeing it as a Venn diagram, and there's some circles that are moving toward each other, but to say that there's this intersection already formed and we can tap into it as, as sort of policy practitioners, I don't see that intersection, and I'd like to see it, but I feel like people are moving in the right direction toward each other. You know, the one comment I'd make is simply an endorsement, actually, for your organization. The Alliance for Peace Bill is actually trying to do some of this type of thing. I would say that uh, certainly the climate in the country is much better than it was 30 years ago about this, where we pushed out the ROTC programs from our universities, and we pilloried the military and public service in government agencies in many ways. Um, I'm glad that that relationship is uh, warmer now than it's been. 
uh, that being said, the uh, both sides have a lot to learn in these types of things. But what I really think is is the most promising for the next 10 years is a better sense about how the div division of labor can work. In other words, we at the Berkeley Center do a lot of studying about religious peace builders. I'm all for it. I'm a person of faith. I believe in it, actually. However, it's most likely that those groups, as Scott Appleby has written, they would be the most effective in prevention on the front end if they had had the relationships with some of the political leaders to, and the capital to, to really try to push on the front. And of course, they're excellent on the back end in terms of uh, the conciliation stuff. However, there's going to be that other time where it's a different set of tools likely that are going to be employed. And that's in some cases going to be the military instrument or other ones. And so I see it as um, we're doing better in the interagency, state, USAID, DOD working together. It's outside of government and government that still doesn't work all that well together. In the front, front row here, AJ. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can wait, wait for a microphone there. Thanks. Hi, uh, AJ Nolte. I'm currently a project associate um, at the Religious Freedom Project here at the Berkeley Center, but up until uh, very recently was a research assistant at the Center for Complex Operations in uh, National Defense University, working on a lot of these uh, interagency issues and with specifically with uh, some of the provincial reconstruction teams in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is very close to um, where I was about a month ago, um, maybe a month and a half. There are two, I think, constraints that uh, realistically, being very pragmatic, that w when you're talking about ending a war, that we have to think about, um, particularly in the American policy context. Uh, the first constraint I want to talk about is um, the popular support and attention span for a war. One of the things I learned working at CCO is that this takes a very long time. Um, you, it, to, to, do the sort of capacity building even to build the basic institutional order can take a very long time in a society like Afghanistan that has been shattered as badly <laughs> as it has been. The second constraint is what I will call, for lack of a better term, um, our tendency for Pyg Pygmalion projects. We like to build governments that look like ours. Um, sometimes that works well, sometimes that doesn't work as well. So given those two constraints, I guess my question is how would those two constraints um, play into the model uh, that, that you've described today. Great. Thank John, you, Agent. John, do you want to say something about this? So, and I, I'll only, I think, really be able to touch on a small element of the answer, but um, one could consider sort of a war effort, right, to be just or not, a good idea or not, and well executed or not. And those aren't bifurcated, meaning something that is sort of pu being debated publicly as just or not, that gets uh, executed anyway. And the neighbors, let's say in the region, uh, take a Sudan or something, uh, uh, respond in a way that just or not, it just makes it a really bad idea and everybody's worse off, right? Or let's say people respond in a way they're willing to give benefit of the doubt in the execution and it's, being, it's arguably just and arguably well, uh, or arguably a, a good enough idea, but poorly executed, somehow the poor execution has a way of bleeding back into the way people perceive whether it was a good idea and whether it was just. It's just a reality of how these things. Um, so to me, it goes a little bit back to a previous question, which says, um, one, think holistically about it, and two, people can support something a lot more easily when they hear a sort of coherent, pragmatic, and moral story for why it's being done. Not half a story, and not ignoring an entire literature, or not focusing purely on sort of a Machiavellian seize and grab power, we'll do moral good later. So the burden, I think, if you want your support to track with the complexity of your effort, you've got to make a, 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 a real push to get the coherence, moral, and pragmatic considerations out there. And in terms of um, our tendency to want to sort of promote things that look like us, well, this is natural, one, because it, 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 it favors the status quo, right? I mean, a communist sort of Russia, the more things touching you look a little bit like you, the fewer sort of threats that you have building on your borders. 
um, I think Eric and I will agree, and I'll, and I'll hand the microphone to him, that, um, you know, if, well, my words here, you, if you ask an American what makes America great or stable or strong, a lot of times they'll answer democracy, and if you say, what do you mean, they'll tell you about institutions. Well, the whole voting thing, and uh, bicameral legislature, independent judicial, checks and balances, right? But it never really was about that. It was, all, all re it was always about the philosophical foundations of what is a just society, right? The concept of limited government, freedom of conscience, religion, speech, equality, the need for rule of law. Let's write something like a constitution and develop an institu institutions that preserve those philosophical things that had already won the day by that time. Because we don't really appreciate that element of it anymore in my view, when America attempts to give this great gift to the world, we tend to export the institutions. And when the institutions get laid on a philosophical foundation that hasn't already legitimized them, and you sort of, you try to match those two things together, you get issues. So if we can keep doing what we're doing here, I actually think leaders, mid-level folks who are gonna be the senior members of our government and, and, and academic institutions later, will we'll just get smarter and better at doing this and won't fall prey to these you know, sort of broad brush rules of thumb that apply to 85% of the situations and they don't notice when they fail in the other 15. They slow down and think about the complexity of this stuff, so. I want you to comment as well, but I want to make sure we get uh, we have at least one more question, maybe even two. Uh, I see that hand in the back there, Joe, Joe Lacanti. <laughs> Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Joe Lacani with uh, King's College in New York City, a professor of history. Terrific discussion. Congratulations on the book, Eric. And um, back to this question of the narrative that some of these actors in the, uh, on the ground have in, in war situations, the storyline that's driving them. It, 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 if I remember correctly, when the Obama administration came in and, and issued its own national security uh, document, it seemed to me that it really downplayed the ideological and the religious dimension to America's threats. I don't even think the word religion, certainly not the word Islam, was even used in the document. And so my question is, does that, is that affecting the culture in the State Department? And, and if, if there is an inattention to the ideological dimension to some of these conflicts, where religion is a driving force, if there is this inattention, then how do you secure justice? And how do you secure anything like a, uh, you know, a just society or order without being attentive to that incredibly uh, potent human dimension. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, thanks for this. And actually, the, this morning I was speaking at SICE across town on this topic about my other book, Politics and Religious World. So uh, thank you. The, uh, the na I think actually that the, this administration's national security strategy uh, belittles religion. It says on page 14 that uh, President Obama, and he said the same thing roughly in two speeches uh, previously. He says, what is it that divides us today? Three things, the three R's, race, religion. Uh, what's the other one? Race, I'm, I'm always on the religion bit. Uh, race, religion, and region. And that the only way to peace is a pragmatic understanding of our shared interests. Well, I don't disagree about the shared interests. However, many people around the world define those culturally and with religious emphases. That's how you understand what is possible to be shared and also what do you need to respect about the other. And so I'd simply say for this book and kind of this framework is I think that what you're calling for and I've advocated and this is where I think a lot of us agree and that is is that we actually uh, in our institutions here in the U.S. haven't done all that good a job in training those who go overseas to represent the U.S. government in how to listen and how to pick up on what those cultural and religious emphases are when it comes to how one defines a just order and what is justice in that society and what is the basis for conciliation. We've talked about interstate war. There's three examples in here that are all civil wars or domestic violence, one's Kosovo, One's Rwanda as a case of justice, and the other one's East Timor as a case of reconciliation. And in each of those cases, you needed localized definitions of those things. So I'm agreeing with your premise, and this is an area where we could do better in our institutions.
Well, and thank you, Eric, and uh, thank all of you uh, very much for being part of this conversation. We certainly already knew, I suspect, that we have a great deal of work to do uh, in thinking about and actually uh, making happen the project of ending the enormous number of conflicts in our world end well. Uh, but Eric, you have helped us uh, be a lot more clear about what kind of work we need to do, uh, given us a long list of assignments. Uh, but I think we have a lot more clarity about the, the, the kinds of tasks we need to work on. Uh, and thank you, uh, John Gallagher, for making your way here and being a part of uh, this conversation. Very much hope to have you back again soon. Uh, and thanks, all of you, for uh, being here. Uh, please give our panel a round of applause. Thanks so much.